The Vatican City is composed of architecture both from ancient Rome and Egypt, as well as from famous artists, sculptors, and architects from the Renaissance period. Hidden symbolism and misconstrued meanings of symbols adorn the capital of the Catholic Church. Consider the origins of Christianity, as it is essentially a juxtaposition of popular cults at the time, such as Dionysian, Mithraic, and Osiris cults, as well as Judaic mystery cults. The Romans opposed these cults and hunted down their members. To survive, a cult and coded symbolism was heavily employed to avoid the Romans, often based off of Egyptian hieroglyphs. Many of these ancient cults didn't survive, and one in particular, Christianity, experienced a revival, but one in which all of the symbolism was taken literally, and thus the Catholic religion formed as a result of this misunderstanding, and from there the church built its empire, unknowingly bringing its ancient symbolism with it. We can see this symbolism reflected in the art and architecture of the Vatican City today. This video will reveal some of the pagan, alchemical, astrological, and hermetic symbolism the church has so desperately tried to erase and destroy. A majority of the gold used in the Vatican is melted down pagan artifacts and relics, and the general architectural style comes from Greek and Roman methods, which in turn was inspired by Egyptian sacred geometry, such as the Golden Ratio. Immediately inside the iconic St. Peter's Square features an Egyptian obelisk standing right in the center along with sun symbology. The paint forms a wheel of enlightenment, or the Dharma Chakra, and the obelisk works as a sundial passing through the zodiac. As you will come to see, astrology serves as the axis in which Christian cosmology centers around. The actual obelisk was built by an unknown pharaoh around 2500 BCE in what is likely Heliopolis. The Romans moved it to Alexandria in 30 BC and moved it again in 37 CE. It was moved from its most recent spot in front of St. Peter's Basilica in 1586 by Pope Sixtus V. The Egyptian monument also has a cross on the very top. Inside of St. Peter's Basilica, over the altar, is more sun symbology. Here, a dove, the Holy Spirit in Catholicism, is centered around sunburst halo. The halo comes from Egyptian sun and mushroom symbology. The halo itself is both the sun and a mushroom cap of psychedelic mushrooms, as a muscaria and psilocybin. You can see the inspiration of the grails for the sun motif used in Christian halos everywhere. To discuss the connection of the mushroom and sun symbolism, we can take a look at papal crests, which are featured in many places throughout Vatican City. The crests are fashioned off the scare beetle, specifically of Kepri, the Egyptian deity of the sun, creation, and rebirth. Kepri is one of the three aspects of Ra. Kepri rolls the sun into place each morning, just as the scare beetle rolls dung. Resurrection was associated with Kepri due to the fact that scare beetles lay their eggs in brood balls and out emerge new beetles shortly after. The Egyptians and later the alchemists romanticized the life cycle of beetles as one of, as one of immortality, inspiring many myths and ideas. Closely related to scare beetles, and therefore dung, are psilocybin mushrooms which grow prolifically in waste. You can see the connections formed between sun and mushroom symbolism. Kepri tied the psychedelic, spiritual experience of the mushroom to the importance of the sun and the zodiac in the context of eternal life, resurrection, and a threefold aspect of God. Scarab beetles, symbols, and jewelry were as common in Egypt as crosses are today among Christians. If this sounds familiar, then you're not the first. Many early and Renaissance church doctors equated and compared Jesus to Kepri and the dung beetle. I'll provide a link that has sourced together many of these Jesus-Kepri comparisons that you can check out in the description. But it's too much to get into for this video. Here we have Calliope, the muse of poetry from Greek mythology, as well as Medusa's decapitated head. Continuing on, we see more symbols of femininity, such as with sirens, mermaids, and seashells. 
Here are two griffins on this fountain surrounding a papal coat of arms. This is a statue of another one of the nine muses, Clio, the muse of history. An Artemis statue stands beside a wall decoration of a mermaid. Here, Heracles is slaying a giant. More seashell fountains, this one enclosed by box hedges. In the Vatican Gardens are fountains with statues of sirens, an odd thing to have in the capital of the most repressed religion on the planet. Vatican City is considered one of the largest art museums in the world, partly because they commissioned some of the most famous artists in history, and partly because they stole anything they thought looked nice, hence why there is so much pagan symbology and pagan gods. The famous fountain of the Pinecone in the Vatican used to reside between the Pantheon and the Temple of Isis, but was moved to the Vatican. The Pinecone represents the pineal gland inside of the human brain, an important organ for producing serotonin and melatonin, and theorized to produce DMT, which makes sense considering that organ's association with spirituality and the third eye. Moving on to the Renaissance artists commissioned by the church, keeping in mind the Renaissance was sparked by the return of Hermeticism and alchemy. The church, especially during this period, had been increasingly tyrannical and violent in its attempt to snuff out the new cultural revolution that was taking place. Interest in classical paganism inspired many of the artists that would end up working on paintings in the Vatican. But many of these artists were unhappy with the oppressive church, and so included many subtle instances of hermetic and alchemical symbology. Apollo in this painting plays music for famous figures in history such as Homer and Dante. The School of Athens paintings reveal how influential Hermetics was to the Renaissance, also how romanticized the knowledge of antiquity was becoming, even by the church. It depicts people like da Vinci and Michelangelo meeting and discussing with Pythagoras, Plato, and Aristotle, and many others. Here is another mushroom sun halo. Yet again, more sun symbology, this time with some sacred geometry around it. Something that is not often mentioned is how important astrology and, and the zodiac were to the ancient Romans, Babylonians, Egyptians, and Greeks. They used it daily and built their lives around astrology. This quote from Hermes Trismegistus sums up the importance of astrology for those ancient civilizations. Hermes here is speaking on behalf of the universal mind the creation force of the universe. I will build the zodiac, a secret mechanism in the stars, linked to unerring and inevitable fate. The lives of men from birth to final destruction shall be controlled by the hidden workings of this mechanism. Great stress was placed on learning and studying the zodiac. Our modern usage of the zodiac barely touches the surface of what it can do, but that is a topic for another video. Christian cosmology is largely based on the zodiac. Here you have Jesus, whose symbol is a fish, right at the beginning of the zodiacal age of Pisces, which was well known to the ancient cults and mystery religions. The twelve apostles are based on the twelve zodiacs and are even acknowledged to be symbolized by different motifs. Luke is an ox, Mark is a lion, John is an eagle, and Matthew is an angel, for example. Michelangelo is perhaps the most famous disgruntled artist commissioned to work for the church. In the Sistine Chapel, there are ram heads, ancient symbols of the feminine and fertility. The church, of course, equates femininity to Satanism, hence why the devil has horns and hooves in Christian art. Also in the Sistine Chapel is the creation of Adam. There is a lot of controversy around this painting after it was noticed that God and his robes match up with the human brain. There's obviously arguments for and against this. I was reading through some forums to see what people think, and I saw one argument that said there was no way people knew what the brain looked like. But that is easy enough to debunk as many of these Renaissance artists were well versed in human anatomy, and even to the point of cutting open cadavers to study proportions and how things work. So it is very likely Michelangelo would have known what a human brain looks like. As to the actual significance of a brain as God, we must refer again to the Corpus Hermeticum. God in Hermeticism isn't so much as a being, but as a oneness of the universe. 
The mind of this oneness is personified in religions and over time misinterpreted as a god in the conventional sense of, of God. Christian doctrines resemble this belief when they say God is in all things. God being an all-powerful, infinite, and eternal being was taken into the literal sense of an actual person, rather than personification and anthropomorphization of different elements, principles, phenomena, and characteristics of the universe. If the concept is difficult to grasp, take a look at Buddhism, Hinduism, and Jainism, in which there is some sort of force or underlying universal collectiveness. So Michelangelo painted God to be a brain, or a mind, because it represents the hermetic and alchemical ideas that had inspired the Renaissance. Right in the center of the Vatican, in one of the most recognizable Christian artworks, is a coded hermetic symbol. And while we are on the subject, I saw another idea that claimed that the brain, and in that case God in the painting, matches up with the Orion Nebula. While I think it's very plausible Michelangelo knew the anatomy of the human brain, I think it's less likely that he had a detailed image of the Orion Nebula, but I do think it resembles the human brain, and alchemy can offer an interesting explanation for why. The microcosm is a reflection of the macrocosm, meaning humans and the Earth or solar system are equivalent to the universe as a whole. The phrase, so above as below, comes from Hermes Trismegistus, and to complete the quote, he says, so within as without, as the universe, so the soul. We could likely align many body parts to the cosmos, as with the brain and Orion Nebula, simply because we are made with the same geometric principles. Consider how an atomic molecule resembles a solar system, or a zygote resembles the molecular structure of the Big Bang. Here are more images exploring the micro-macro relationship of the universe. These patterns are noticeable across every phase of existence, hence the importance of sacred geometry. The way science teaches the universe today purposefully omits things like sacred geometry, astrology, alchemy, numerology, not because any of these things were disproven by modern science, but only because the church funded the scientists of the Renaissance era. The church could not stop the cultural revolution taking place, which threatened to uproot Catholicism altogether, so the tactic they used was to steer that cultural revolution. They funded a majority of the scientists that shaped the world, such as Newton, Galileo, Kepler, da Vinci, Copernicus, Francis Bacon, and so on. All of them would consider themselves either alchemists, hermeticists, or Pythagoreans. They worked within the context of the church because the alternative would have been to be executed or imprisoned for heresy. Today, many of the most prominent universities and royal societies have strong Christian presence and influences. Astrology was one of the main beliefs the church wanted to destroy. However, as all of their scientists worked with astrology, and most of modern science is based on discoveries made with astrology, it would be difficult to then disprove astrology. The church did what it always does when it wants to erase something. It says that it's of the devil and a satanic practice. So yes, because the Catholic Church didn't want people to have control of their own lives, as there's no profit in individuality, science today doesn't incorporate astrology into anything, except to say how far we've gone from the primitive human. Again, it's never been disproven, just discarded. As for alchemy, the church was highly interested in the legend of transmuting metals to gold, another misinterpretation of the coded language in which alchemists recorded their findings. The church funded charlatan alchemists to create their favorite thing, gold. Since those times, all alchemy is thought of as a more primitive idea of science, when in reality it is science that incorporates astrology and respect and love of nature in an animistic universe. I think this is a good place to end the video, and it sort of concludes the last two videos or ties them together in terms of a broad overview of alchemy, symbolism, and hermeticism. There's a lot more paganism in the Vatican City that I didn't cover, but hopefully you get the idea and can start to notice some of the symbolism yourself. As for the next video, I'm not sure what I will do. I could go either more into occult and alchemy, or switch to something else for a while. It just depends on what you guys would like to see. But yeah, 
that's it peace out